Century Communications presents a public affairs special, smog and how it affects our health. Smog season is beginning, folks. It's end of April, and as the summer comes along, and especially toward the end of the summer and toward the fall, the smog becomes a very serious problem for all of us in the L.A. Basin. To talk about that, joining me are Linda Wade, who's the executive director of the Coalition for Clean Air, Mary Nichols, who's the assistant administrator for the U.S. EPA, Dr. Henry Gong, who's from Rancho Los Amigos Medical Center, and John Michaels, who's chairman of the South Coast Air Quality Management District and also a supervisor of San Bernardino County. Thank you all four for coming on the show. Uh, and I'll just start with you, doctor. Uh, tell us uh, what this uh, PM10 is that people are talking about now, this particle material we talk about that's in our air. We've actually had problems with uh, PM10 for decades. Uh, we've uh, focused largely on ozone as a principal component of smog in Southern California. Yeah. But now uh, scientists and doctors have actually honed in on another problem, and that's the particles that you mentioned. Mm. PM10 um, is abbreviation for particles 10 micrometers or less in diameter. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, these are very fine particles, very small solids and liquids suspended in air, in fact, uh, just to give an example, the thickness of this paper mm -hmm. is 100 micrometers. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about particles Can that are even see. 100 to 10 times smaller than the thickness of this. Mm -hmm. So these particles yep. are problematic in terms of health effects because when they get that small, people inhale them. Mm -hmm. And when they're inhaled into the airways and lungs, people can develop problems. Uh, and who's vulnerable to this? Well, studies have shown that basically people who are elderly, who have chronic heart and lung conditions, people with asthma, and children seem to be the susceptible groups. Now, is it true that the lung capacity, especially of our children who are growing up in, in, in these areas of L.A., is less than, than, than uh, children in other places in the country? There is some evidence uh, supporting that. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, what alarms uh, doctors mostly is that the epidemiological studies of PM10 have shown that there are other effects, much more serious, in fact, such as premature deaths. Uh, there have been several large studies uh, performed in various areas of the United States and even throughout the world, which have shown that people can actually lose one to two years of their life uh, in relationship to uh, particles in the air. Now, are, are these particles increasing uh, each day, or we have less of it today than we did 10 years ago? Well, since the 1987 PM10 uh, regulation came into effect, overall, uh, about, we've had about 20 percent reduction overall. Mm -hmm. However, uh, epidemiological studies have shown that we have health effects, such as the deaths, such as asthma attacks, uh, hospitalizations, that type of thing that have actually uh, been associated with levels of particles that are still within the legal limits, mm -hmm. so to speak, the regulations. So this concerns us in that sense that uh, what's happening, we, we need to know. Well, and, and that just goes to you, Mary. It does concern all of us, and obviously the federal government is concerned. Uh, what is the federal government doing about it? Well, our role at the federal level is to set national air quality standards that define what public health is and then turn it over to the states and local governments to actually do the regulating to achieve those standards. Mm. So we have underway a massive review both of the particle standard and of our ozone or traditional smog standard. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a couple of innovative things this time around. First of all, we're focusing in on the fine particles. Henry mentioned that right now we regulate the uh, PM10. Mm -hmm. and those are very small particles yeah. but it turns out that as best we can tell the worst health effects are actually associated with an even smaller size of particle down around two and a half microns in size and what's significant about that is that the two and a half uh, particles the very fine
fine particles tend to come from uh, sources like automobiles or um, burning of fuels as opposed to things like uh, forest fires or um, uh, incinerators, which are the things that we've tended to focus on in our particle regulations Does and our controls. Does this now mean that in those regulations and controls we have to change the standards, we have to uh, create new legislation to regulate this? Well, I think what it means is that we can refocus our efforts to go after the things that create the highest risk first. Mm -hmm. And by looking at the fine particles and the ozone standards at the same time and developing a joint uh, control strategy, recognizing the fact that people don't just breathe one pollutant at a time. Yeah, the soup right. that we breathe has a lot of stuff in it. Mm -hmm. If we can look at these two of our worst actors together, we think that we can actually home in on the major bad actors and, and get more benefit. And, and when you say that, who are the major bad actors? What really creates this uh, pollution for us? Well, it's us. It's the way we drive and the way we get energy, basically. If you boil it all down to the simplest, lowest common denominator, it's the fuels that we burn and the vehicles that we drive and uh, the, the major sources of energy combustion, which is bas basically the power plants. But uh, the doctor was saying that we have improved our, our, our air quality. How did we do that? Well, we did it through strong regulations that push technology, and the technology has gotten better. Today, uh, the automobiles that roll off the assembly lines are probably 90 percent cleaner than they were when we started this back in 1970. But nevertheless, there are more of them. There are, uh, in this basin, uh, many more people, about, uh, I think it's over 25 percent additional population and more than twice as many vehicle miles being driven every year than when we started these regulations. So we're we're the victims of our success, if and, you will. And with that success, though, the, the price of gas is going up right now. And, yes. and one of the issues was saying, well, it's because we have to create cleaner, cleaner fuel. But now I'm seeing that's well, I think that's Not a bad true. it's a bad rap. When the reformulated gasoline program came into effect at the national level, the refiners estimated three to five cents a gallon to yep. produce it. Right. And of course, they lobbied for this legislation because they wanted to hold off the pressure to go to alternative fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, now they're I, I think they've stuck with that assessment. They're being honest about it, but they have other reasons why they claim that the the price is shooting up. Now, Jen, you're in San Bernardino County. Now, let's face it, all the air kind of pushes up against uh, the mountains there and, and sits there more than it does at the beach. Uh, uh, what, what does the Air Quality uh, Management District do? What, what are your responsibilities as chairman of this group? <clears throat> well, our, our district was created by state statute, and uh, its uh, membership uh, is formed by local government representatives from county boards of supervisors, and from mayors and city council people, along with three appointees, one by the Senate Rules Chairman, one by the Assembly Speaker, and one by the Governor. And our role is to uh, take the standards that have been set by uh, Mary at the Environmental Protection Agency and at our state, and actually uh, write the rules that businesses and uh, sources of emissions within the district must uh, conform to. And uh, how's it been going? I mean, there's this controversy around. In fact, that some of the leaders in the new legislature uh, talk about getting rid of your organization. Well, I think the organization has uh, survived this far, and, and I, I presume that by the end of the session, we will still be there. Mm. Uh, it's hard to argue with the success that our organization has had. Uh, one statistic that I gave you earlier in our discussion was that we've gone from uh, 83 days of uh, stage one smog alerts 10 years ago to 14 last year in 1995 and that's significant progress and that progress has come through the uh, the regulatory activity uh, undertaken by the South Coast District here in Southern California. Well that's really quite an accomplishment but what are some of these regulatory things that you've did that have brought it down to 14 days? Oh the, the, the number of rules are many and they affect many different sources of emissions and uh, some have multiple effects on different uh, sources of pollution. Yep. But with regard to uh, particulate matter, we're in the process now of uh, developing what will probably be the most comprehensive study of particulate matter uh, undertaken in the country. And that is in anticipation of uh, developing our demonstration of attainment, which is due to EPA. And, and that year for attainment is set at the year 2006. And so we've, we're undertaking a lot of analysis, studies, uh, measurements, uh, and uh, trying to characterize particulate matter to understand all the various sources from which it emanates and so that we can get a good handle 
on what the most appropriate and cost-effective controls that can be placed to reduce the effects of PM10 are. Now, the automobile plays a major role in this, Major true? role. Uh, there was a plan that by 1998, 2% of our automobiles should be uh, zero emission, meaning electric, and then it would go up percentage-wise uh, in the years ahead. That's kind of been taken off as, as a commitment. Uh, uh, is that uh, your, your reaction to that? Well, I think that uh, zero emitting vehicles are the, is the cornerstone of air quality attainment in Southern California. There's absolutely no question about it. It represents two-thirds to 75 percent of the emissions. And in terms of particulate matter, it's the uh, chemical reactions in the atmosphere formed from combustion uh, whose main source is vehicular emissions yeah. that forms the most heinous type of particulate matter, the nitrates and sulfates that uh, uh, we breathe deep into uh, our lungs. Mm. Uh, Linda, this brings us right to us, the people, the community and community groups, the Coalition for Clean Air. What is it and how do you impact this, uh, this issue? Well, we're a nonprofit environmental advocacy group. We've been working on clean air issues for 25 years. It's our 25th anniversary this year. And we've been working very closely. Um, our, our mission is to educate and work with the community, let, to let people know about air pollution, the health effects, and with a focus on children's health. Because as we talked about earlier, and as Dr. Gong mentioned, children are the most vulnerable. And um, we should pay particular attention to that. Mm -hmm. So we work with the community. We educate. We bring programs out. We have speakers bureaus, volunteer programs. Programs, and we also work with the regulatory agencies and we work closely with the regulatory agencies and it's it's our job to sort of nip at their heels to make sure that they're they're doing a good job and they have been doing a uh, a very good job the progress that we made last year that John mentioned yeah the cleanest year on record it's because mm. of the very regulations that these agencies the standards they set the regulations that they adopt and implement and so we need to keep moving in that direction or we'll never continue that progress well one of your your chief supporters Ed Begley Jr. Mm. says it, a lot has to do with the individual and Abs how the individual absolutely. impacts the issues absolutely. and since you are community based uh, what do you tell us out there those of us watching the program that we should do ourselves and that we can do ourselves that can impact the smog issue what we can do well, what you can do is call the coalition for clean Air, and I'm happy to give you our phone number because we really do want to work much more closely with the community in a much broader fashion. Mm -hmm. But you can watch the kinds of consumer products that you buy, whether it's deodorant or hairspray or the kind of uh, where you take your car to have it painted. Um, you can drive clean burning vehicles, um, promote the use of clean burning natural gas and electric vehicles. Um, cars are absolutely a huge, um, a huge cause of the pollution, but also trucks and buses. Diesel trucks and buses have to be cleaned up. And we can work with community groups, with the regulatory agencies, to show our support for this kind of advanced truck technology so that we can continue to make the progress. But also I would, mm. I would ask that all parents, and even if you don't have children, call the Air District, call the Coalition for Clean Air, find out what the day's air pollution forecast is and change your activities if a smoggy day is predicted change your activities wait and start earlier in the day or wait until evening hours don't be out there running up and down San Vicente Boulevard if we're having a smoggy day or riding your bike out in Riverside San Bernardino during the heaviest periods of smog now should we be uh, using our barbecue uh, in the summer well yes you should if it's the right kind of barbecue and the right kind of um, you know, gas barbecues are the best. There's also a new reformulated um, lighter fluid. John might be able to give you a few more details about that that you can use. But regulations have been um, imposed in this basin so that the lighter fluid we used here is cleaner than in other parts of the basin. Well, this is good news to hear on such a bad subject that things are moving in the right direction. And viewers, we're going to take a short break and we'll be joined by a couple more panelists. So stay with us. We'll be right back. The Earth is in a race with global warming, and the Earth is losing. Together, we have the power to fight global warming by demanding more fuel-efficient cars. Contact the Sierra Club. It's outrageous, the fees that we have to pay for our health. Bill Rosendahl and Week in Review, your source for the latest on the personalities and issues making news. You know, okay. To be continued, because this will go on and on in the months ahead until it's on the ballot. Local issues, global concerns, the questions and people that affect our lives. Keep up to date with Week in Review. Every Friday through Sunday at 3 and Friday and Sunday night at 9, only on the Century Channel.
Welcome back. Joining me now is Susan Tellum. Good to have you, Susan. Thank you, Bill. Um, who's a spokesperson for the American Lung Association. It's good to have you. And Bill Vandenberg from CalStart. We want to know what that's all about, too. Susan, uh, you've heard of the discussion here. The air is improving. Uh, but yet, we do have people who have impacted from it. You, you are one of them. That's right, Bill. I'm uh, an asthmatic, have been for about 15 years, and I've lived in Los Angeles since 1960 mm -hmm. and have uh, never had asthma. And as the air got dirtier, and I, um, I, I assume I have uh, become an asthmatic because of uh, all the different fact factors of dirty air mm -hmm. having an impact on it. Where do you live? What part of the, the basin? West Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. But yet the air over here, they say, is cleaner. Well, not according to my doctor. Mm. He won't let me go out on certain days. Um, and um, I know that uh, when I see the dirty air and when the buses shoot out a big black of fumes in front of me that I suffer from asthma uh, attacks more frequently. Mm. And what can you do about it? Well, a lot of medication. Mm. I also have a, a, a piece of equipment called a nebulizer that I have to carry around in my car and at home and in the office because uh, when I have a severe asthmatic attack, it's the only way I can get uh, medication deep into my lungs, which is where the PM10 ends up, actually. Mm. Now, do you sometimes wear a face mask? <clears throat> Uh, if I'm doing something outside that could cause more problems, yes. Um, not generally in the house. I have an air cleaner in the house going most of the time. Mm. And, and if we could just turn to you, Bill, CalStart. What is CalStart and, and uh, what kind of solutions do you have for us to, that really affect Susan and others? Well, CalStart, uh, just to start, is a consortium, a collection of 185 companies across the state of California, now globally around the world, mm. working on advanced transportation technologies, cleaner technologies that still move people around, uh, natural gas vehicles, electric vehicles, hybrid electric, and, and new transportation options for people. People don't like to get out of their cars, so they should be driving far cleaner cars, but there are some really interesting transit options coming up as well. For instance? Well, we're operating a station car program in Northern California at the BART stations. We'll be bringing it down south and operating it out in the Inland Empire area as well mm -hmm. sometime this fall. It involves small two-passenger electric vehicles that sit at transit sites. People coming into those transit sites might drive their own car if they had to get off transit and still were three miles from their work site. Mm -hmm. But with a fleet of small electric cars that their company leases or they lease, they ride those cars for a completely clean commute to their work site and back. We're, we're starting the, the, the work up at BART to tremendous success. People love the idea of these flexible little vehicles mm -hmm. and leaving their own car at home. Now the electric car uh, was put on hold in terms of the mandate of 1998 and the manufacturer said frankly has to do with the battery and getting the right battery. Is that true? Do we have electric car technology now that could come off the shelf into reality? Yeah we do and, we do. and, and the debate was really over marketability to a broad market versus whether the technology is ready for applications right now. Mm -hmm. General Motors as you may well know is going to sell its electric car in California starting this fall and in Arizona. Uh, Honda just rolled out a car, the RAV4 electric, really a fun little car. Mm -hmm. Honda has an electric car. They're starting to bring them to market now and in bus applications, and in transit vehicle applications and in some consumer commute applications, they're ready right now. Now what about the natural gas? I heard it's a cleaner fuel but I don't see enough of those vehicles out. Why? Well, I think what, what's happened is there's been a, people have wondered what's coming next. If I'm going to invest in a new technology, mm -hmm. do I invest in clean diesel? Do I invest in methanol? I think natural gas is shaken out as the leader in this. And in fact, the Metropolitan Transit Authority for all of Southern California yep. has committed to putting in about 200 natural gas powered buses. It was a long decision, but they finally bought into it. These buses are particularly important because the particulates are almost non-existent out of natural gas, far below diesel and it's really important to get these vehicles on the road. So it's a huge step. This will be the largest fleet, single fleet of natural gas buses in the world once this gets going. And Mayor, you're nodding your head. Uh, does this suggest that maybe the federal government, uh, in its wisdom, and is encouraging us to move into these alternative vehicles? <laughs> well, we're absolutely encouraging it. We have uh, tax incentives for people. Uh, the federal government gives you up to a $4,000 tax break if you buy an electric vehicle. 
We have uh, grant programs through the Department of Energy. We also have regulations uh, that require areas that have severe air quality problems to have clean fueled fleet mm -hmm. programs in place. And we're, uh, as, uh, as Bill was indicating, we believe that there are markets for a number of these different fuels, that it's not a matter of choosing the single application mm -hmm. for everybody, mm -hmm. that there may be uh, areas where natural gas is the winner, mm -hmm. others where electric is what's needed, but the main thing is to move forward forward on the better technologies overall. That's great. And, and Linda, you were talking earlier that the counties most affected are what and, and what are we doing and how are we emphasizing those areas? Yeah, in the Riverside San Bernardino area, Ooh. although I know that Susan is affected and there are a lot of people who live on the west side of, of the basin who have um, respiratory problems, but Riverside and San Bernardino have the most problem with particulate matter. Um, it's because of the, the dust issues and just because of the way the meteorological conditions are in this basin, the pollution that's, that's produced on the west side of town is transported via wind patterns to the inland valley. So those areas, and people in those areas need to be especially careful. Um, and I also want to um, take this moment to, to remind people about another important program. It's the smog check program, whereby every two years we have to go in and have our cars smog checked before they can be re-registered. And it's a very important program. The, until we are driving, all driving the kinds of clean cars that will be available someday, we need to have our gas burning cars to make sure they're tuned up and that they get the most efficient um, use and mileage. Now, now, isn't there a program also to buy these old clunkers, these lemons? There is a program, and it's, it's an important program. Uh, we I think it's, a, it's one piece of the puzzle, but it's relatively small because there aren't that many of them. It's a short-term solution, and it is important, but um, we need to be um, concerned about a couple of aspects. Um, the people who drive those cars are predominantly more lower-income people, so we, we have to decide how are we going to replace cars for those people. Yeah so that they don't just buy another dirty car and so mm -hmm. that they do have, they get a fair market value and can replace those cars. They need those cars to drive, so we have to work, work out some of those issues. Mm -hmm. and, and John, if we could turn to you, uh, we, we heard what Mary said about some federal supports. Uh, and how does this uh, air quality management district support the idea of CalSTAR to get into alternative vehicles and cleaner uh, emission vehicles? Well, we do it through uh, a, a number of, of means, but one of the particular ones that we're working on now and trying to energize is a credit trading program mm. under the theory that a ton is a ton uh, and if we can get tons cheaper from the uh, mobile source sector by allowing trading uh, that doesn't create alternative problems on its own yeah. that we have uh, a methodology uh, in place that can get additional emission reductions not now credited mm. that we would not get unless we gave the ability to um, sources to substitute. So we've had uh, the program that Linda just mentioned, mm -hmm. the old vehicle scrappage program has been one, and that's been memorialized in a rule. Uh, we also have <clears throat> a number of indirect source measures. Uh, that's really the extent of the district's mobile source emission control capability because most of that's retained by the State Air Resources Board, but in indirect source control it's a matter of reducing uh, the emissions from vehicles that are attracted to particular centers, be they employers or entertainment centers or event centers. Mm. But we think, uh, we think that uh, probably the, the most effective way to deal with those sorts of indirect mobile source emissions is perhaps through some formulation of market or pricing mechanisms as opposed to regulatory, strict regulatory format uh, to be able to achieve that. We've worked uh, for a long time trying to increase the average vehicle ridership uh, of cars on our freeways. Yeah. To the extent that we can go to one and a half people per car from one, we've eliminated half the can cars. You, can you also get the governments, the various types of organizational structures that have vehicles, uh, to clean up their act? For instance, when they get behind a school bus, it's usually the filthiest vehicle on the road is a school bus. And, and these are, you know, districts, school districts, or some of the other government vehicles, of having some regulation that makes them clean up those Well, I think that's a place that we need to start at. I think government has to lead the way that, through their own fleets. They have to lead the way in terms of providing the, the initial infrastructure yeah. and the private sector can follow on once the government's demonstrated mm -hmm. that it can work. Sure, Bill. I was just going to say that uh, John's district has been really innovative in terms of not only helping technology move forward, working with small companies to move the technology, but yeah. in, in providing money and resources to, to cities and municipalities 
to choose their own solution, but mm -hmm. to have money to say, okay, I will put in some electric vehicle recharging sites. I will buy some electric vehicles for my fleets. I'll buy natural gas vehicles and mm -hmm. buses. So the district actually has been kind of a leader in that, and I think we need more incentives. I think the district wants to move away a little from forcing people, but by giving them the opportunity to choose, I think we can show an industry that's starting to make those options available. What are some of these incentives you suggest? Well, I think we need to help people, give people some resource, and I think the Air District has done a good job of spreading resource around the municipality, saying, okay, you've got to clean the air. Here's some resource that we take back in from people from their registration fees yeah. that you can use well, maybe to I buy clean vehicles. Just to mention another, and I think yeah. John touched on it earlier, but um, if you have regulations that are as tough as the South Coast District has, and mm -hmm. they really have regulated just about everything that you can think of that emits any kind of pollution, yeah. sometimes complying with those regulations is, is extremely expensive, and mm -hmm. it becomes politically very difficult. That's why it's very tough for the state to require small school districts to buy clean school buses because the reality is those districts don't have enough money to operate the buses they've got now you know some of them are hanging on by their yep. fingernails yep. but if you ha can allow an industry that would have a very expensive control cost to instead buy up the pollution in yep. effect by controlling the school buses or getting a clean new school bus mm -hmm. for that school district the pollution comes out of the air everybody's health is better off and you've saved money into the bargain so well those said. are the kinds of things well we're said. trying to think uh, about. I'd love to know Susan has anybody raised your comfort level here about what they're they're doing and, and, and heading? Uh, and what would you like to see done uh, that wasn't discussed here? Well, I'm not sure if they've raised my comfort level, frankly. Mm, yeah. I, I know the air is cleaner. I don't feel like it's cleaner, but I know it is cleaner. Mm. Um, I do, uh, I know that people are trying, but politically there are a lot of pressures and problems, and um, I know dates that were supposed to have electric vehicles were not met, and mm. other areas have not been met. I've been yeah. following it for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, one of the things that people can do who have or suspect they have lung problems is to unite and get into the uh, the kinds of programs that Linda has and to join the American Lung Association because they put a lot of dollars into helping to push forward legislation and so mm -hmm. on. And for example, May is um, uh, American Lung Association's Clean Air Month and um, if I can throw in a plug, if you Please call 1-800-LUNG-USA, <laughs> <laughs> you can get uh, uh, brochures and information to help people who suspect they have lung disease and how to cope and mm -hmm. who to call and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Doctor? Yeah. Yes, I'd like to interject that Please do. Uh, I think it was already mentioned, uh, the term incentives. And I yep. think the, from the perspective of the health scientists and doctors, certainly the key incentive is better health, better lung health, uh, even better heart health, as the uh, pr uh, particulate literature has indicated. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we should emphasize that. Uh, think about square one, the foundation of why we're having all these regulations, even if they're not politically correct at times. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there's a real reason why we need to improve our air quality for health reasons. Uh, I might also add that, uh, as John uh, alluded to, uh, we probably do need uh, more research in this area. Even though we think we know everything about everything, uh, certainly uh, fine particles. What is the real mechanism? Why do they cause deaths? Why do they cause asthma attacks, mm -hmm. as in Susan? Well, let's just keep Why? that point because the half hour is up, but, but we have to answer those questions in, in the months and years ahead. I want to thank all six of you very much uh, for your insights and comments uh, into this issue that affects all of us living in the basin. And I especially want to thank our viewers out there uh, for sharing their time with us. God bless you, and bye-bye.